So, who has come today from outside of Oxford first? Because I know we have a few who's come. Okay. Who's come from outside the country? Who's flown in from this event? Two, three, four. Okay. And if anyone doesn't mind identifying themselves, who else is it? Curly, Alan, Fuzan, Six, Seven, Ten. Very nice. Okay. So, I'm going to give you some basics of who Dan is and what a what is and then we'll open up to the floor for kind of more specific questions. So first, Dan, you tell yourself a lot as the fifty billion dollar man, a lot of people have noticed that and talked about it. Who where does that figure come from? We have um, tens of thousands of uh, people that have sent us their uh, results, but that 50, 50 billion can be represented by only two individuals. One has created 29 billion in equity and value, and one has created uh, 26 in equity and value. Uh, the, um, we have uh, several, uh, and by the way, I can only use 50 billion because there's another 90 billion that the, they don't want me to uh, use their name. Sally, my chartered accountant wife, contends it's because they don't pay taxes. Uh, I can't say, I can't confirm or deny that. I do know uh, we have tens of thousands. The pundits say that I've touched millions of people. Um, uh, I don't know that for a fact. I do know that I've, uh, I've touched hundreds of thousands. But for example, when somebody goes out with no money, uh, starts a company, uh, does uh, 50 or 100 million in turnover, and floats it for uh, 250 million, that's 250 million of the 50 billion. And we have uh, several that have done that in the billions uh, in the last 23 years. For example, uh, Rick Scott founded Columbia Healthcare, the largest healthcare company in the history of the world. It grew from zero, well, that's not quite true, it grew from 100,000 to 28 billion. I mean, so, I mean, the, uh, the, the 50 billion is important, guys. <sighs> Nobody else talks about numbers. And um, there's a reason why. Because nobody else has created any goddamn numbers. I'm the only real high-performance coach. I'm not a success coach. I'm certainly not a personal development coach. They tell me I'm a pretty good motivational coach. But I'm the only guy that talks about numbers because I'm the only one that has created any. Uh, the, uh, and also, and it's a point that I, I neglected to point out, I give all my product away free. I'm not here to sell you anything. I couldn't give a shit less. I give it all away free. All my product is free on my website. Free, like an F R W E. Why do I give it away free? One, I don't need the money. And two, I don't want to give you any excuse why you won't do it because it's too expensive. Because I contend most people only pretend to want to be successful. They're not willing to make the sacrifices. We have a pay price to action. We all know how to lose weight. More exercise, less calorie intake, right? Well, then why are so many of you fucking fat? <laughs> you know? How about you girls that it look like, uh, well, never mind. I won't say that. <laughs> I, won't say, I, I promised Henry I wouldn't talk like that. But I mean, there's a pay price to action for every single thing. You all know. But you don't do it, you pretend. And so you pretend to want to be successful by taking all of these other courses, but you think that that's taking action. My mantra is just fucking do it. Pull the trigger. You've got a lot of information, kids, not just you in this audience, but everybody on the planet that's interested in bettering themselves. But the dots aren't connected. And the only way you can connect the dots is pull the trigger, trigger and take action. You think listening to a podcast, reading a book, uh, etc., is taking action. It's not. It's procrastinating so you don't take action. And I can just look at your sorry faces and we got a lot of procrastinators in the audience. And the Oxford kids have not really been launched into the real world when they can really start procrastinating. So, oh, thank you for the validation. I came all the way down here just to get the validation from this kid in the front row. But the, the, the other guys, one, have to make a living, and two, um, 
the, uh, they've got an upsell, a side sell, a this, a that. I have none of that. And all my marketing gurus told me I was making a huge mistake when I decided a few years ago to give all my product away. Now it's all free. But now, you know what you're complaining about, kids? Where do I start? You have hundreds and hundreds of pages of this shit. What am I going to do? Now what, now, what kind of question is that? To somebody that's, you know, really serious. I.e., you're not really serious. It's a game. Why am I looking at you, Joel? Uh, no, don't crawl down. Okay, okay. Are those eating lads around you? No, no, I know Greg's not. Now, how, why do I know these people in these audiences? I shouldn't, other than the fact that I'm mentoring them. But, and, um, and, the, and, uh, but, and I mentor the kids for a year for free. Uh, why? Only the Lord knows. I'm not sure why. <laughs> and I have mentored some of them over 20 years. So they're out there, just like you. We have um, uh, many calculations. And somebody wrote me, uh, when you grow $820 into $450 million in eight years, that's 67,000% a year return for a total of 567,000%. When's the last time you ever heard anybody grow anything at that rate? You don't know anybody that's grown at that rate. You've never heard of anybody. And he gives his shit away for free. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Let's unpack a little bit of what QLA model actually is. So to everyone who's not aware of what this is, you've got natural numbers you know, that are making lots and lots of money virtually quickly. That's how, how do they do it? It's the same thing. I do. It's, it's, in fact, I was in my preparation for, for being here. Uh, even though I know I can, I can write uh, Andrew Carnegie's stuff by, uh, by memory. He, um, his first, he had four successes, uh, uh, four secrets to success, Andrew Carnegie. He wrote these about 110 years ago. And in my judgment, the greatest entrepreneur that ever lived, uh, the greatest uh, uh, mover and shaker that ever lived, and uh, comes from right down the road from Guthrie Castle, where I live, in Dunfermline. Furman. Uh, and uh, he, number one, financial motive must prevail, okay? Now, I know that's not politically correct now, and a lot of people don't want to hear that. Hi. Uh, and, uh, but what he was doing is he said financial motive must prevail so he could have more choices. As you well know, or you should know, he gave all his money away or died trying when he got at the end of his life cycle. We do it, and he did it the same way I did it, the same way um, Sloan did it at General Motors. It's by rolling up uh, uh, fragmented industries. In other words, t seeing an industry in chaos and looking for low-hanging fruit and then acquiring through roll-up, through acquisition, bundling up, taking, uh, um, making uh, management, good management decisions, employing good management techniques, and then selling on to an industry giant and or taking it public through a flotation. Uh, the aim... Um, exchange in this country was brought to bear 20-some 20, 20 years ago for that very reason. To have cottage industries an opportunity to be floated, to be sold off. And very simply, you buy mom and pops at five, six, seven, eight times earnings. And for those of you that you don't have to be business uh, students, it's after-tax earnings, and you float them at 15 or 20 times earnings. And you create a spread, you create an arbitrage of some 10 or 15 and you get fucking rich. People have been doing it for 150 years. 150 years. Why everybody doesn't do it, I have no idea. All I know is I've been doing it 45 years on my own and 23 years with you kids, and I've been able to create um, what I have. People often ask, and one of the questions you might ask, Dan, why did you stop doing it for yourself? It's a damn good question. And I'm about to answer for about the 90 millionth time because I found it easy going from 820 to 450 million. It wasn't much fun. I bought up 40, 50 companies. At the time I was doing it, how come nobody else is doing this? I took it public on my 39th birthday. 
I crystallized it. I made it real. And then I did it 30, 40 more times um, until I left in 1992. And what's, what's even a better story, when I did it, I, did, I took an option public. For the first time in the history of the world, I took something I didn't own public. It's like having an option on a piece of property or having an option on a house. But I floated it. And when we went to the takeover panel in the Bank of England, and they said no, and we asked why not, and they scratched their Oxford heads and said, we don't know, it just hasn't ever been done before. And a, and a, and a, and a genius kid named Jeremy Knight uh, uh, put together a structure and we were able to float. So not only, and so I took something I didn't own public. You can't do that anymore because they've changed the law subsequently. Um, but that's what, uh, we roll up fragmented industries and we look for somebody that started a uh, car dealership 30 years ago. They're now 60 years old. Their kids don't want to have anything to do with a dealership. We, I'm just using dealerships because they're, they're very fragmented. We buy it from them and we buy it from 15 or 20 other people that are also motivated sellers. We roll them up together uh, and uh, we sell to uh, there's a, there's a uh, company called Auto. They're a public company that roll up uh, car dealerships. I can't think of the name now. Um, or we sell, we sell to an industry dealer or industry uh, player. Who buys these things if you can't take them public? Pension funds. Annuities. All the time. Now private equity funds. Hedge funds. And one of the great myths in life that there's no money out there... That's the biggest lie. I can think of some other lies that have sex, sexual connotations. Maybe some of you guys can think of them. But it's a lie that there's no money out there. We have never been more flush with money in our history. I keep thinking interest rates are going to go up, but they don't go up. Kids, you're going to look back 10, 20 years from now, and you're going to see that you should commit suicide for not taking advantage of the goddamn low interest rates we've had the last five, seven, eight years. You're going to look back and say, God, Allah, Buddha, what the fuck did I do wrong? But see, guys like me know that. I'm not going to have any regret about that. Lord Sugar is not going to have any regret about that. None of the icons that you read about every day are going to have any regret about that because they're, they're borrowing money like stealing from a bank. I mean, they're walking into banks without a mask and without a gun. And you're sitting where? Where are you sitting? You decided to take another uh, elective course. And for the old gits in the audience that I can see now, uh, well, I don't know what the hell you're doing. I don't know what the hell you're doing. That's what a roll-up is. And it's been going on since Andrew Carnegie. So it's not new. Yes, Henry, go ahead. So how much you all meant to you went up? Today and so industry. How much would they own on that deal over time to the If you if you do it right, if you walk right off the campus of one of the colleges around here, as did my young mentee in 1998 or 1999, he had between 40 and 60 percent of each deal. 40 and 60 percent. 40 and 60, but as little as 10 or 15 percent depending on how you finance it. If you finance it all commercial lending, you'll have 80 or 90 percent. If you finance it with private equity, etc., you'll have a very uh, much smaller portion because the private equity um, players will take a big chunk of the deal. Cool. This is your, your book that you give on your seminar. It's now out of print. It's called your first 400 million, which is pretty bold. It's now on sale on Amazon for $5,000 a copy, not by me. Exactly. Which pisses me off. <laughs> How many of your students have made a hundred million dollars or more since you started teaching? Hundreds. That you know of? A hundred. Yeah, I mean, I had a question on why you give your material away for free because I, I read this book on time because you tell me everyone to go on time and read it before. I told him to finish school, finish his uh, master's and whatever the... Whenever, uh, whatever the hell it is, some kind of biochemistry or some, 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 something. But I told him he should finish, 
And then I told him in biotech, I just roughly said biotech, roughly, and I said that um, the market was going that way in another couple of years, you'd be in a better position and in a, with some extra uh, letters after his name um, uh, to go out and raise money. And the two biggest levers in life are other people's money and other people. And I've, I've been able to do it with other people's money and other people. And there's nothing immoral, you know, and, and it kind of, not a kind of, the benchmark I use, it's got to be, it can't, it's got to be moral, ethical, legal, or we don't do it. Moral, ethical, legal, or we don't do it. And, uh, but the, the, the biggest hurdle that the kids have, and I call you all kids again, <clears throat> is that you, you, it hasn't got through your, this, your skull, that the guys that are saving the planet now all made a fucking ton of money and now we're saving the planet. The Musks, Gates, Buffett, Ellison, they all made a lot of money first. And when you, when you create wealth, kids, you have more choices. You can have choices to do bad things, which I don't recommend, or promote or endorse, or you can do good things. And the current crop of kids thinks they want to do good. So far, with the greatest respect, I haven't seen too many put their money where their goddamn mouth is because you haven't made any money yet. All you've got is ideas. But that's great. You've got to start someplace. Now go out and create wealth and then go out and do good with it. As my daughter, uh, if she was sitting in the audience, she's going to be 30 in a few weeks, who's heard this stuff since she was in her mother's tummy, uh, she said that my generation, Daddy, she says, don't get the part about making the money to have more choices. And she's right. I hate to admit, my daughter knew something before I did, but she's right. And she's a product of a much better education than I had. Um, but you've got a lot of choices. The, the names, uh, Musk is the most, well, not most, but one of the most popular names right now for all the stuff he's doing. But he made money with PayPal, and he did all those things. And then because he was in uh, uh, vogue, he got money from the government. The best place to get money for anything that you want to do is the government. Whether it's a, na a national government, a municipality, or a county government. Because they have a real challenge. If they don't use it, they've got to give it back, and they won't get it the next year. Now, when was the last government that you knew that one wanted to give it back, and two didn't want it the next year. None. None. Um, but choices. And as in, my infamous, in my daughter's infamous words, Daddy, if they understand that we have more choices if we create wealth, I think that it'll resonate better with the kids. Her being one of them. Her being one of them. Last question for me. It all sounds kind of simple when we put it up here. Do you think anyone in this room could go and make hundreds of millions of dollars in your system? It is simple. Can everybody in this room do it? No. Because everybody in this room is not willing to make the sacrifices. I don't know how to do it for our work week, which came up uh, a little earlier. I don't know. And I know Ferris. And if you believe the four hour work week, I've got a bridge to sell you in New York. <coughs> I mean, uh, one of the comments from the seminar that just ended, from the 1820 kids, all of which were about half my age. We had a couple of old gits in their 40s, but most of them were uh, less than 30. Uh, they commented at breakfast the last uh, day, which was uh, Saturday or Sunday. They said, how can he still be so fired up running on 200% of all its cylinders when he's been on his feet 15 hours a day for six, seven, eight days? And we've been sitting on our arses, uh, and we're tired, and he's not. You know why? Because I, and if you don't find something that you love what you do, don't bother. Because if you don't have a passion for what you do and you love, it gets old. I say this stretching a little. Um, it's like a, uh, a significant other that you've been around too much. You know what I mean? Everybody in this room can relate to that, I think. Okay, well, if you're not passionate about what you do in life, it gets old, and then it becomes work. And as soon as it becomes work, you're finished. The reason why I'm fired up 
at the end of a six, seven day week of 15, 18 hours a day is because I'm passionate about pulling you sorry asses across the goal line. Because that's my goal in life now, to pull as many of the sorry individuals on the planet across the goal line as I can before they put dirt on me. And I'm so far, I'm the, I'm the leader in the, on the planet, but I, I, I don't want to be the leader by just 50 billion. I want 500 billion. I want 500 billion. I'm selfish in that way. I'm, I'm greedy in that way. And I have nothing to gain by your emotionally growing as individuals. Nothing. You know, other than uh, they may put a statue up. Uh, and I went to a school that you have to explain about. For those of you that are Oxford students in here, you don't have to explain about Oxford. I went to a school that you have to explain about. Well, it's this, that, and it's got a good, okay. But when, in 19, um, 90, 1991, when I was voted the most successful alumni in the history of the school, big fucking deal, you know? The school had been around 40 years or whatever it was. Now, if I had been voted the greatest alumni in the history of this school, I would have competed with some heavy-duty guys and gals, right? But I didn't. As they say in Scotland, I didn't. I didn't. And, um, but everybody in this audience that went, is going to school here or went to school here has that opportunity to be considered as one of the greatest alumni. And I was very surprised that Professor Hawkins went to school here. I had always attributed him... Or, uh, to uh, Cambridge, um, but for those of you that go to school here, you know he went to school here, but um, I say slightly tongue-in-cheek, he doesn't brag about it for some reason. Maybe he knows something I don't. Okay, go ahead. Uh, we might the audience. If you want to ask questions, take your hand up. Yes. Yes. Okay. Right, so so you can start up this question rather than not be able to hear that. Apart from not seeing Josh, apart from you know, the critical backstage, I saw one of the other day. What else would make you want to see us? Give me more criteria. As far, say it again. By the way, this kid came, came to me when he was 16. How old are you now? 17. 17. By the way, we have 17 and 18 year olds doing hundreds of millions in transactions as I stand or I sit here today. Thank you. Now ask me again. So, so I was watching a seminar last week and you're talking about Josh, you're talking about how Josh, he's one of the superstars, yeah. You were saying a lot of a lot of you guys do two uh, bank interviews a week. You used to do and Josh did three to four a day. What else can make me a superstar? That same okay. criteria. He, what he's re what he's referring to is um, there's no shortage of money out there if you have the right deal and the numbers make sense. There's just no shortage of money. What, what uh, he's asking is that one of the kids who is now 18, who uh, is uh, doing very well, um, he uh, was making several presentations um, a week. And I used to have a, uh, a rule of thumb, uh, two presentations a week. But when I was doing it, and the, and the, the highest performing individuals are giving five or 10 or 15 or 20 presentations a week. They're calling on and giving presentations, selling your dream, and I emphasize the dream part, to 15 or 20 financial institutions, separate financial institutions. Uh, for every single deal that might come out of this room, for yourselves, there is a place on the planet that will fund it. That's a guarantee. So all I would, to answer your question is, you know, triple your effort. I mean, whenever I look at in the weekly reports for the kids that come to the seminar, they have to give me weekly reports, which are pretty uh, onerous, especially since you've never been held accountable for anything in your miserable little fucking lives. You know, the average kid barely knows how to wipe his ass and brush his teeth. And the ultimate of not being coordinated if you can't read the paper and take a, be, take a dump. But that's the average kid. Now, that's pretty pa pathetic, as they would say in Ireland. But that's, you've never been held accountable for your time. Never. And you wonder why you haven't accomplished more. So triple your effort is the answer. And when he came to me, uh, uh, it's when I give the London Real thing for uh, Brian QLA Rose, which is, he's changed his name. Brian 
QLA Rose. And he turned 45 the day before yesterday, and I think he had a daughter yesterday. Or son. I forget which now. And when you have kids, it doesn't matter whether it's a boy or a girl. There's, they're going to be uh, pains, contrary to reading all the books about it. Um, the, um, the, the kids understand that the wall of China can still be built. The old gits in the room that have had failures think the wall of China cannot be built. And if you go to the engineering school at this fine university, I can give you a hundred engineers that will tell you the wall of China can no longer be built. 8,000 kilometers long, 72 trillion uh, blocks. Uh, we can't, uh, they'll give you all the reasons, right? The kids don't have all that baggage. Oh, well, fuck, I'll just put a stone at a time and build a son of a bitch. And that's why the kids following QLA have so much damn success because they don't have all the negative baggage. Whereas all the guys with gray hair and no hair in their heed, as they say in Scotland, that have been beat up. Self-esteem is built the first seven or eight years of life. Have you ever seen an unhappy two or three year old unless they gotta have their, pants, their uh, diapers changed? They're happy, and then they turn into you. <laughs> what the fuck happens? You know what happens? Your parents happen. Another question. Thank you. Are you the one that tried to sneak in the back? Yes. Yeah, he tried to snuck, sneak in the back and ask me a question. Go ahead. Hello. Um, my question is, you talk about lazy. Well, okay, tell, who are you and where are you from? My name is Robert. I live in Oxford. This couldn't be close to my house. So. Okay, so it was convenient. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't have come. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, you talk about laser beam focus. Correct. I own at the moment. Um, I try as best as I can to focus on one or two things a day, but I've got quite a lot to do. Is it better to outsource as much as I can? No. Uh, well, okay, let me, let, let me answer you piece by piece. Without even looking at your stuff, if you didn't do 75% of all your stuff, it doesn't matter. If you never did it, if you never turned to that page on your laptop, 75% of everything you do on, on, on a day-to-day -day basis in the cosmos of time is in a fart in the wind. 75% of everything you do on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't need to do. 95% of everything you do has nothing to do with making any money. 95% of, no matter what business you're in. So when you say I, focus, I try to focus on one or two things a day, try to focus on one thing from 9 till 10 in the morning. If it's not complete by 10, focus on it from 10 to 11. If it's not complete by, focus. For those of you that have more than one business, just turn the keys on them. Everybody, for staying, turn the key. Close them. Close them down. Close them down. 98% of all the business ideas that come to me aren't worth a shit. And 75% of those 98 you've been fiddle farting around with for years. That's your way of not having to face the fact that one, it was a shit idea, and two, you got to come up with another idea, and three, you can procrastinate. It's like, again, I go back to a bad relationship. She wants to get rid of you, but oh God, I got six years invested in this asshole. Or she, uh, he wants to get rid of her. The girls seem to be smiling more about this than, uh, than the guys. I mean, the devil you know isn't as bad as the devil that you don't know. That's, that, that's right, that's right. Keep shaking your head up and down, that's right. So, you got, just eliminate most of it. Go back and find where did you make your money last month? If you're engaged in stuff, that you didn't make any money in the last six months, close it down. For those of you that have internet businesses, this is my favorite. Sally and I, my lovely wife, have been in the internet business. We were one of the first in the late 90s. One of our companies was 3Click.com. Affectionately, we call 3Click.fuck. <laughs> and for a 70-year-old man, I probably know more about the internet than any other 70-year-old man on the planet. If you're not getting conversions, if you're not getting hits, if you're not and you're internet-based, forget about it. You finger-farting around with it for the next 
three days, three weeks, three years is only going to produce sore finger from finger farting. Okay, next question. Okay, well. Yes, sir. Right here. Understand it, find it, that flowing conversion. Uh, just wondering, how important is it to stick to your word when you give it? Absolutely. It's the most important thing. Uh, integrity is everything. I mean, if you don't have integrity, you have nothing. And um, Warren Buffett's got a three point uh, thing. I forget what the other first two are, but he says if you don't have the third, integrity, forget the first two. And, um, you, and you only have one time to make a first impression if there were. First impression is that they lied to you or they uh, twisted the truth or however you want to call it. That's a big red flag. And uh, I don't have time for, for them. So I hope it answers your question. Next. Hi, Mr. Pena. Uh, Carl Brown from Monday. I'm a food company, mostly health. Uh, if I'm looking to roll companies up in that kind of sphere, what, what am I looking for? You know, numbers or, or kind of. Uh, well, you're, lo you're looking for motivated sellers. A motivated seller is normally 55 to 65. Now, I say this, it sounds awful, but uh, mom and pop owned. Mom has, uh, you know, cancer. Uh, dad is spitting up blood from emphysema. Now, I'm making it a gross exaggeration so you understand. Motivated seller. Motivated. They went out. Their, their children don't want to take over the business. There's no succession planning. There's nothing. Um, and uh, so that's number one. Number two, you're looking for uh, uh, multiples of uh, EBITDA. We'll just call it after-tax earnings for this example, of, uh, uh, that you're willing to pay three to five times EBITDA. I could fill up rooms ten times this big if I just put on the Internet, buying for cash, any business, three to five times after-tax earnings on the spot today. Three to five. I could fill up Wembley because most of the business, 95% of all businesses that go for sale yearly don't sell. Why? Because they're trying to get wealthy off one transaction. They've worked 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you know, in their shop or whatever the hell it is, their dry cleaning store, or whatever it is. Um, and uh, in that, when it comes time to sell, they're trying to get wealthy so they can retire off one transaction. That's not how you get wealthy. Wealth is built all over a series of transactions. A series. And that's why you know people that have tried to sell businesses that haven't been able to. When the kids come to me and the kids read my material, I tell the kids who are in their 20s can do a roll-up five to ten times in their careers. If you're in your 30s, you can do it three to six times in your careers. If you're in your 40s, you can do it three times in your career. And if you're in your 50s, you can still do it a couple times in your career. You don't build wealth off one transaction. Unless you uh, get lucky like with Instagram and with Zuckerberg paying over the top uh, for it. But I mean, you're all waiting for an Instagram. Guys, that's not going to happen to you. It's like, I'm not going to ask you how many are involved in apps. That is a license for stupidity. I mean, better you, you swallow cyanide pills. Everybody talks about apps. There's maybe 8 or 15 apps that have ever made, have ever made a goddamn nickel. Maybe 20. But you think your fucking app is going to save the goddamn world. Are you stupid? Retarded? The only guys that make money on apps are the guys that tell you how to make money on apps. That's it. I can just tell I hit a raw nerve there. Ooh, we got a lot of app lovers in the room. Sally and I and our crack team spent three and a half years looking at all the permutation apps. And then we lined up. We passed a revolver with one bullet in it. And we... And the guy that uh, was unlucky enough, or lucky enough, depending on how you want to look at it, that got the bullet in the head isn't here right now. So you look for companies that are three to six times after tax profit, that are motivated sellers, 
and that are in fragmented industries. And healthcare and telco stroke internet are still the two places to go because they're massive consolidation. Now, if National Health Service ever does anything that they say they're gonna do, there will be opportunities for roll-ups in this country for the next 50 years. Whether they ever do it or not, I don't know. But they've been talking about it for a long, long time. Did I answer your question? No. You're not smart enough to figure out synergy. Don't worry about it. There's nobody on this fucking Oxford University that's smart enough to figure out synergy. So it's not going to be you. Next. Yes, the, the, here, the kid. Yeah. Um, my name's William. I'm from Paul. Um, you just spoke about uh, healthcare and technology. What do you think about the public abandonment industry, especially with the referendum coming up? I, I don't make a bets on whether the referendums are going to come up or not come up. I don't make bets on the chancellor's budget. I, 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 when I first came here in 81, I don't understand why everybody waits around for the goddamn budget. I don't. And then they don't, do any, they don't do anything before the budget, and you guys don't do anything after the budget. So what the fuck's the difference? <laughs> it's an excuse for you not to do anything. No, I don't care about the referendum. Property's good in a bull market. Property's bad in a bear market. It's very simple. And some of you aren't old enough to have ever seen a bear market in London Mayfair property. I have. I remember the last bear market in Mayfair when five million pound houses went to a million six. Hard to believe, but it happened. Okay, next. This young man with the glasses. Um, what's the quickest way of uh, repairing self-esteem? I thought you were going to ask me another question that I was going to say. I had my answer all. You look like the kind of guy that would ask a different kind of question, but anyway. Um, okay, so self-esteem is the, is the basis, is the root of all uh, high performance. I mean, you may not like guys um, uh, like Steve Jobs, who I happen to have known, or some of the other guys, or myself for that matter, but we all have high self-esteem. And uh, it's, it's strange for us to, uh, to believe that people don't have self-esteem. But of course, we were raised different. You know? But the way you repair self-esteem is show me your friends, and I show you your future. For example, if you are sitting around, now I don't know why I'm thinking about you when I say this, if you go out to the pub and watch sports bars and they're farting and belching at the pub, you and your mates, that's where you're gonna be in 20 years. Belching and farting with your mates. You are the, you are the average of the people that raised you. So it's if your mom, maybe your dad if he was around, your brother, sister, maybe a, a grandparent. But now going forward, since you're all over than, se over than seven or eight, as I can tell, is it's, uh, it's show me your friends and I show you your future. The biggest thing that uh, uh, Brian QLA Rose changed, and you saw a massive change in him in the last two years, it's, it's, he's only scratched the surface. 5% of the change that he should be making. 5%. But I said, you show me your friends and I'll show you your future, Brian. And he, he woke up. And as he, he said in, in his blog, I went back to my room sobbing and wanted my mommy there to cry me, uh, tuck me in, cry me, uh, I cried myself to sleep. Because I hit it right on, I hit the nail right on the fucking head when I said that. Because by definition, guys, the London Real guys, for the most part, need, uh, the whole peer group thing needs to be tripled up. Because high performance people don't hang out. High-performance people don't go to group meetings. High-performance people don't do any of those things. High-performance people fly like eagles. They fly alone. I don't have any friends. I've got four or five guys I've known 40, 50 years. They came to my 70th birthday. We don't hang out. We don't go to the Super Bowl. We don't go to the World Cup. And we certainly go, don't go for fucking beers uh, watching sports in sports bars. We don't have time. We don't have time. Self-esteem, new, you need new association of people. Now, one of the most successful uh, mentees that I had many years ago, who uh, had gone to prison, unfortunately, and uh, was looking for, uh, he needed to rejuvenate his life. And in those days, they had block cell phones. 
black cell phones. I say the quickest way you can do it is go home and change the number, and then if people call the number, it says on the answering part, if you don't have my new number, you're not part of my life. Now, I just had some kids do this recently, and they said, God damn, is that effective, Dan? He says, but my mother cried when she got the message. <laughs> okay. I, I, I don't like to slag off mums, but part of the reason that you're not squared away is, oh, love, uh, lovely mum. Okay. Yes, sir. Right there. Hi, Dan. I'm Dave from uh, Russia. Uh, I know you're not a fan of and I'm one. Well, no, no. Well, well, I, I, it's not that I'm not a fan of engineers, but I'll go ahead. I'll tell you why in a second. Go ahead. To get into acquisitions and QLA, what do you think are the most important skills for a young engineers? Okay. It's, QLA is harder for engineers, accountants, um, because they're trained you're in lawyers, because your brain's trained to think uh, in a sequential manner. It's like an engineer says, if I make a mistake, if a doctor makes a mistake, one person dies. If an engineer makes a mistake, 100 people could die on a bridge. Now, that's a little far-fetched to me, but I understand. But engineers, and Brian Rose is an engineer, a mechanical engineer out of MIT. You have to, it's hard for an engineer to be macro thinking. 60,000 foot Concorde, okay? You need people to cross the T's and dot the I's, and that's what the dream team's about. And that's, this is all on my website, all on my website. But you shouldn't be the one. Now, there's two things on my website. One is deal flow, and is, one is uh, um, a podcast, How to Get the Fucking Money. Deal flow and How to Get the Money. Deal flow, okay. Those are the two least looked at vis a vis Google Analytics on my website. How do you get the money and how do you get the deals? Of all the hundreds of pages I have, the two most important goddamn things are looked at the least. Now you tell me, geniuses, why the fuck that is. Because you're not serious. You know, if, oh, he tells me how to get the money, and then he tells me how to get the deals. Well, Christ, I got no more excuses. Of all the things on my site, those are the two least clicked. Two least. And you don't have to be an alpha male. I got another podcast. Do I have to be an alpha male to do this? 98% of all high performance people are on Henry Kissinger's end of the continuum. Everybody, no, maybe you're not old enough to know who Henry Kissinger is. Um, who's another soft spoken? Who? Richard Branson. Branson, okay. Or so, at that end. Only 2% of us are Ayatollah Khomeini, me, Donald Trump, Genghis Khan, etc. <laughs> Only 2% of uh, high-performance leaders are at my end of the continuum. 98% of them are just like everybody else. So I've got another one. Do you have to be a half a male? But I've got another podcast that's not viewed that much. Is QLA really for me? Because that podcast says that you've got to be willing to make sacrifices. Meaning, long hours, focus, dedication, etc. Okay. Okay, the one that's uh, the pub guy. Okay, him. This guy here. Hi, uh, my name is Tim. I'm a doctor and I'm trained. I also run. A doctor? Yeah. What kind? I also put doctor in Okay. So they die under your mask. Okay, go ahead. Well, yeah, okay, okay. okay. Um, I run private uh, health clinics as well. Let's roll them up. Exactly what I'm planning to do. So I've got my. Well, in five years from now, I hope somebody in this room knows him. So if he hasn't done it in five years, you can slag him off. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I clicked through the Dan Lok uh, website. And One of my stars that put a bunch of my stuff together. Really helpful, actually, to go through that. Listen to the um, sort of acquisitions kind of uh, things you've got on there. Put together, putting together a dream team. Going to get some money to uh, roll up dental practices. And now, are you... Are you uh, Anesthesiologist, both for doctors and dentists? Uh, potentially, yeah. Well, um, as well as patient aesthetics, both. Oh, he's got a license to steal. I mean, banks love guys like you. Yeah, I've noticed. Uh, 
<laughs> it's not the way you dress either. <laughs> okay, well, okay. And uh, he looks like a pretend weightlifter too on top of it all. Okay, go ahead. Um, so the, the one thing that I was wondering is, is having it through everything and tried to write it down and work out what the best way to do things is, the one thing I couldn't figure out was knowing what you know now in light of the way you've worked with Rick Scott and other individuals in the healthcare sector, what are the pitfalls as, as going forward for me now? There's only one. Only one. Lack of action. Because every acquisition you're going to try will not succeed. And as soon as, let's say, the first or second don't succeed, your wife, your mother, your brother, your mate, the guy that went to medical school with you, are going to start to question what you're doing, and then you're going to start questioning what you're, what yourself. And you set. Once you, that enters into your pea brain, you're dead. You're dead. So, pulling the trigger... Now, I'm a, uh, uh, no, he's not in on, but one of my um, uh, um, mentees is a, a vascular surgeon. And uh, I just happened to ask, have you ever lost a patient? I asked him, and he hadn't. And then uh, a few days later, he had. And uh, the, uh, then I wish I hadn't goddamn asked him the question from before. I just thought he'd been a, a surgeon a long time. No, no, he had 14 years, he never lost anybody. Huh? Well, he's, he's, uh, I don't know, but he had never lost one, but he lost one now. And so, um, the, uh, but it's one of the few times, because I, I, I don't really care what I say, as you probably already know, but I mean, the, but I had wished that I hadn't asked him that question. But no, just do it. Just roll them up and do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah correct. Just do it and um, don't look back. And uh, just do it like uh, you're, you're Jesse James going into the, the bank with no guns and no mask. And the, and the banks will give you money left, right, and center. Wrongfully, I might add. They, because doctors are in, uh, characteristically shitty managers. And they lose money the best at the top of the list. And the top three of losing money as, as investors are doctors. Okay, next. Yes, sir. The guy here with the curly hair, right here. Oh, so you're, you're a license is still in the making. Okay. So I was wondering, upon graduation, what price to take a similar route that you talked about using your vehicle in your methodology, and if that's the right path to take off. Well, absolutely. You know, I tell the kid, well, if, how close are you to graduating? Well, I'd still graduate because it's, it's easy. In medical roll ups, the only thing Rick Scott could have done better is if he had been a doctor instead of a lawyer. Because part of the problem he had, and part of the problem of doing hospital roll-ups, is doctors don't think correctly about their management. Uh, and uh, in many of the hospitals that you'll try to acquire, uh, if you do that, or uh, the surgical centers are owned by doctors. And uh, the, um, but still look for motivated sellers, a doctor that's been there 20, 30 years, or doctors that have been there 20, 30 years, that have no exit. Uh, what you're doing, guys, is you're providing them an exit to liquidity that they wouldn't have any other way. You're doing them a favor. You're doing them a damn favor. And uh, the doctors, in that particular instance, or anybody that has the fragmented businesses, know that you're doing them a favor because they've got nobody else to sell to. But I would go after small critical care units, and if the NHS does what... Um, they say they're going to do, and they, but they've been saying it a long, long time. Uh, I mean, it, uh, you'll be able to go in and buy up assets because the entire industry will be uh, in chaos. And from chaos comes order. So my question following from that would be, I have the opportunity to go to America on graduation. Would that be something? You mean do your residency there? Right. Yeah, I mean, it's a bigger pool. It's a bigger pool. It's a bigger market. There's more fragmentation. You can go down into Alabama, Georgia, Arkansas, I'm not saying you want to live there. There's nothing wrong with living there. But I mean, and you could just, you could uh, do uh, uh, rolling up the fragmented industries. Okay. Finally, well, I was, was going to ask about the dream team um, and contacting people, CEOs and things that I'll tell you. You'd say you're a, you're, you're a medical student, 
uh, you're building your dream team now, uh, but you'd like to talk to them about being part of that dream team. So it's all right to do it um, um, now. I mean, three years may be a little soon, but you can practice because none of you are going to be Lord Olivier in give, talking to these guys. You're, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to step on your dick, as they say. Uh, so we, we, you know, it gives you a year or so uh, to practice. Not dissimilar to what I told Henry. Uh, uh, Christ and, Christ and, yeah. uh, and you'll be you'll be making contacts. Yeah, that's all great. Like, okay, awesome about any decisions. Correct. Uh, uh, Absolutely. That's, that's great. great. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, let's let's take the, the the bald guy with his hand up with a gray shirt. Uh, thanks very much, Dan. In your podcast, you speak a lot about... Okay, who are you and where are you from? My name is Greg. Are you MI5 or something? I mean, uh, don't tell your name. Just the ball guy in a group. Okay. Uh, yeah, so you, you, I came up from London today. And so thanks very much. So in your podcast, you speak a lot about finding your passion. Correct. And rolling and sort of wrapping that up in what you go. Then in the same way, you talk about the biggest opportunities being in healthcare... And okay. Now, for those people that don't have any area that you're really in love with, I say, and I have said for years, healthcare, telco, stroke, internet. If you've got a passion in something else outside those two, then go for it. Then go for it. So if it's, you know, whatever it is, I mean, uh, but a lot of, a third of the kids that come to me have no idea what they want to do. I, I might have mentioned this. A third of the kids that come to me have an idea that's no fucking good, and a third of the kids that come to me have an idea that can be fixed. It's okay and can be fixed. And, and not all of those are anywhere uh, near uh, all in uh, healthcare and, uh, and telco uh, stroke internet. So just go after something that you know that you can do 10, 12 hours a day and not call it work, not get tired of it. Well, I mean, some of you, I'm a junkie addict, a transaction junkie, I mean, tra transaction junkie, that I love the deal. I just love the hunt of the deal, so I don't, it doesn't matter what industry that I'm in. Uh, and now, after all these years, I've pretty much gone from A to Z. So if you, if you are truly a transaction junkie, and there's not too many of those, but if you are, then it doesn't matter what you start in. And the other thing, I tell the kids, your idea is going to morph, it's going to pivot, so don't feel guilty because it pivots. And your initial dream team is going to morph and is going to pivot. You may not start, or you may not finish with the same dream team you started with. And that's okay. And don't feel, you know, you know, stuck in concrete. And the guys and gals that you bring on to the dream teams understand because they've done this before. The only one that feels guilty about asking somebody for somebody's resignation is you. They don't. They don't. Okay, I answer your question. Okay, the guy in front of him, right there in front of him. Hi, my name is Gil. I work in acquisition consults at Mississippi, a few from Germany. Good. Uh, I was actually going to ask back on his question on passion, because I'm into deals, I do deals, uh, I front them. Uh, obviously, I'd like to be on the other side, but I don't really have a specific passion for any specific industry. So I'm trying to figure out, first of all, you know, the, the driver for me is the deal making. Can you actually have the passion for deal making without having passion for this? Yes, absolutely. I have no passion for, well, hardly anything. And the only passion I have is getting the ball in the net. That's it. I'm a, what's called a 20 yard specialist. My speciality is when you get down close to getting the deal in, I, I, I uh, there may be better guys at it than me, but I've never met any to get the ball in the net. I know how to do that. And I know better, more importantly, I know how to get the team as feeble and crippled as a team can be, either emotionally, psychologically, or physically. I know how to, you know, uh, pump cement up their arse. And so uh, they, uh, they, um, they, they get the ball in the net. And m most of the, you guys in the audience and gals, where you're going to find, and I don't like to bring up problems that, uh, that before they exist, is in your leadership skills, because most of the people's, and down deep inside, the reason why you don't go to deal flow and uh, how to get the fucking money is you know your leadership skills, you, you can't even get your four-year-old to fucking potty train. 
I mean, so how am I going to get mature adults, seasoned veterans to do anything? With great difficulty. That's how you're going to do it. But unless you try it, you're never going to get any better. And you're going to be sitting here 10 years from now listening to somebody else. So you just got to pull the trigger. You got to pull the trigger. You got to pull the trigger and not care about um, the results. That's not to say that, oh, I can lose. Don't take it the other way. Well, well, uh, I can do, try all these things and not be, be successful. Because if you have that attitude, the, the glass is half empty instead of half full. It'll be a self-fulfilling prophecy by God. You won't get the damn thing done. So for right now, you like the transactions, just keep pulling the trigger. Uh, let's, try, let's try the guy in the very back. Uh, hi, Dan. Uh, pleasure to meet you. Uh, I've been following this. Uh, Where are you from? Well, just so I'm so quiet from uh, North Cape. Um, I've been following this stuff quite a bit. Brian Rose is on the mirror stuff for about a year or so, and it's really uh, transformed my game. So, uh, Good. To, to do some more stuff. Uh, main question, following up from perhaps the chat over there. Um, how is the fear? But is the fear that these people have is it they don't want themselves? Um, the um, I, I normally do this in my my clothes, but I'll do it now. What all you guys are describing so far is you're afraid, or as they say in Scotland, you're feared. You're feared uh, because you, you, you're unless your parents were uh, Agassiz and Steffi Graf. Both, both world champion, you know, gold medalist in the Olympics. It's not likely you were trained to be a high performance person. Unless your name is Rockefeller or Kennedy or whatever, it's not likely you were trained to be a high performance person. And so you're afraid, uh, you're afraid uh, of making a mistake. You're afraid of what everybody's going to think. You're afraid of looking stupid. Uh, one, of the, one of the characteristics of high performance uh, people are they engage in self deprecation. Well, most people in this audience would rather cut their fucking toe off than have people laugh at them. Because you have low self-esteem. I mean, uh, the high-performance people that you may not like, Donald Trump, etc., who I know, uh, myself, I mean, you have, as I told Brian Rose, you have no idea how limitless you are when you don't care what other people think or say about you. And to answer your question, it is fear that drives that. It is. And most of your mates that you hang around with are just as afraid because you pick somebody like yourself to hang around with. I mean, and, uh, I, in the seminars when I used to give them outside, I'd pick a guy that came with three guys, or two, however many came, or a gal, and it was embarrassing. I mean, it was, got very debilitating for them. I mean... Now, I say this, some people believe me, some people don't. We've had people pass out. We've had people piss their pants. We've had a big four, a county partner, shit his pants. Shat himself, as they say. And then put it on his fucking stationery and write me a letter. Thank you. I didn't know I was alive or a real man until I shit myself. You're afraid. And the guys and gals that you hang with, I don't know what that means, or chill with, are afraid. So if everybody you associate with is afraid of their own shadow, then how the fuck are you going to be any different? You're not. You're not. And I look at some of my... Uh, uh, recent uh, devotees, and I see their little eyes sparkling. But you get a new set of acquaintances, not friends, starting with the board, and you spend less to no time with the old, people, old ones, and you'll see. You, can't, you can change the direction of your life today. You can't change your life today. But you can change the direction of your life starting today. So to answer your question, I mean... We spent a lot of time, I mean, uh, I think the third slide or the fifth slide in the new seminar, and I change it every time. I'm not, uh, seminars are booked up, please, don't bother me saying that you want to come to seminar. Is the seminar is really about the psychology of fear. 
because everybody's afraid, myself included. And it's not what happens to us in life, guys and gals. It's how we react to what happens to us in life. That's the difference. You know, Winston Churchill writes about being afraid. Uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt writes about being afraid. But it's the action we take in spite of that fear that differentiates us. And the guys that are the high-performance guys learn to deal with it the best. I deal with it pretty damn good, pretty damn well, and, and, and the kids that I've trained over these years. But the people that have created the billions learn how to deal with their fears. And then, uh, how's Ar Argentina? No, Brazil? Brazil. A Brazilian lawyer? Don't be giving away your Brazilian business cards. Okay. See, I actually, I actually remember you people in your, in your stories. And I remember his, too. And I said, why the fuck would you? Anyway, that's a whole other story. And, 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 because I, I spend time with people as I travel around. I have free time on my site. You can see that. Come and see Dan. Da, 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 da. And uh, I do it for, and don't attribute too much Mother Teresa to me about it. But I do it for three selfish reasons. One, number one, it allows me to keep my thumb on the pulse of you idiots around the world. What you're really doing and not what you're just saying and emailing me. Because you email and, you know, uh, me different stuff than you actually do. You, you're much braver in an email than you're eyeball to eyeball with me. Okay. Number two, I do it to see if there's any new trends that I'm, I perhaps am missing. Because the kids in the trenches see and hear it first before I do. And number three, I do it because I know that you, rightly or wrongly, take it in a positive way to help change your situation. Um, as I did with this young couple that's down here in the, on the left, which I actually remembered, I actually remember everybody that I meet. Some people I'd like to forget as soon as I've met them. I'm going to say something that is going to be the most controversial thing I'm going to say now. A, uh, a Muslim lady came in to see me at the Ritz. And whenever I see women at the Ritz, uh, I, my wife's in the suite. She comes in to make sure that, just like you, make sure that my wife, you know I'm not alone there, if you know what I mean, okay? Because not every, not every woman that comes to see me has the right intentions. I'll just leave it at that, okay? <laughs> so, and she was there with her burqa, and a very a pretty girl. And she, and she had followed the steps. She knew the stuff cold, and she said, um, and she told me what she thought was her, her biggest um, detriment, and she said it was, uh, she says, as me being a Muslim. I said, no, that's not the biggest deal, and, um, and so she looked at me, and she said, well, what could it be, and I said, um, and then I asked her, are you pregnant, and she almost fell out of her, her burqa, or like a ghost. Why would you ask that? And I said, because um, I'm just asking. And she says, no, I'm pregnant. Well, I, I was hoping if she was pregnant, she was going to tell me she was pregnant. And I said, no, your biggest um, challenge will be other Muslim men, not the fact that you're Muslim and trying to succeed, but trying to do it against cultural and all those things. And so then she, uh, she said, thank you. And, um, and uh, I haven't heard, that was three or four months ago, but I told her what to do. Because you have your perceptions, your different perceptions of what's important and what's not. And they may not always be accurate. Because people that believe in political correct bullshit don't tell you the goddamn truth. They don't tell you the truth. As one of my billionaire kids, who's a minority, says, the, thing, the, the biggest difference with Dan is he tells you what we think but won't say. Now, fortunately or unfortunately, I've been in this waste for a long, long time. And when I graduated, when I got that big award in that little teeny school that you got to explain about, and the CBS correspondents got the mic in front of the, uh, in front of the uh, dean of the School of Business, Dr. Teeter, you've known Mr. Pena for 28 years, blah, 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 blah. You must have seen a lot of change. And Dr. Teeter, surely, God rest her soul, she's gone now. She says, no, I haven't really seen much change in Danny. That's what I used to be called. The only thing that's happened with Danny Pena is his accomplishment accomplishments caught up with the big fucking mouth. <laughs> now what kind of, I'm there getting the award of the goddamn century, what kind of shit is that for the dean to say? What got worse? 
they go and they put the microphone in my dad's face. And they say, Mr. Pena, you must um, uh, be very proud of your son. And he says, I am. I'm very proud of him. But, and this, when the but, and the shoe's about to hit the ground, he says, but my son is successful not because of me, but in spite of me. And kids, to the extent that you've got any success out of your lives, for the most of you, it's in spite of your parents, not because of them. Because love just don't get the fucking job done, contrary to what you've been taught. And as I said in my, and I, this is the thing I get most requoted on from London Rio. And when your mom's sick, you're not going to pay for it with Zen. That is the most quoted or requoted of any statement I've ever made in my 45 years of profession, being a professional. I mean, the, because when you, it resonates and you think about it, I want to know somebody that paid his master's charge with Zen. Just let me know, because if you can, I want to learn how to do it, and I want to teach my chartered accountant wife who's sitting in the back, honey, we don't have to pay our bills anymore. We're going to, you know, I'll, I will then start meditating. I will then do all the things I've never done if we can pay our bills monthly. Another question. Yes, sir. Now, to be fair, I called you the bald guy with the gray shirt and the bald guy with the jacket and the white shirt. Go ahead. Yes, Mr. Benia. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Adel Sharif. Um, I've been uh, following your calls for some time. I'm really uh, privileged to be here and meet you in person. Thank you. Um, my question is, the, uh, there should be a different mindset in those who really create wealth uh, like you. Uh, just the, the, the masses. So, what is the, the top uh, few things you see that you know the wealth producer people that do just from that anywhere else? I'm going to tell you a, a thirty second story, and it's a one word. It's on the internet, so you guys at Google all the time can verify this. Uh, Bill Gates wanted to hit me this before he met Warren Buffett. He wanted Warren Buffett as a mentor, and so um, he was trying to figure out a way. You know, Warren answers his own phone. But anyway, so his mother, Mrs. Gates, said she's going to have a dinner party. Didn't tell Bill Jr. or Bill Sr. He's got a successful lawyer as a father. And um, so Bill comes home from a business trip, and the people sitting in the living room, a couple of uh, luminaries, I think Ellison was there and a couple of other guys, and Warren Buffett. And so Bill Gates asked his mother, wow, she says, just like a good mom, you wanted to meet him, so I just invited him over for dinner. Anyway... So they're sitting around the dinner table, and there was a lull in the conversation, as there often is, except for when you drink a lot, then there's not too many lulls, but apparently they weren't drinking too much. And Mrs. Gates decided that she should ask a question to the table, not to any one specific person. And she said, what would you attribute your success to? Warren and Bill Gates Jr., with one word, fired back, focus! And that's the answer to your question. And I've made it laser beam focus. When I created the $450 million dynasty, as they say, over that seven, eight year period, I was laser beam focused on one thing and one thing only. One thing and one thing only. And you kids, because you've come up with excuses, reasons to procrastinate, internet, this, that, and the other. This last seminar I just gave, we had one young kid who had read 640 books. One young kid. Needless to say, he had never pulled the trigger. Now, as one of my superstars would say, this is, these numbers are old, who would you rather have on your team? Somebody that had read 700 books or done 700 deals? Now, I'm the guy that had done 700 deals. You know who's the guy that read 700 books. I've now done over a thousand transactions. Who would you rather have? Who would you rather listen to? Who would you believe the probabilities were or are that it's going to be right as opposed to wrong? Most of the people that you've listened to, with no exceptions, have not got a pot to piss in nor a window to throw it out of. Most of the people that you've followed 
some of which I've trained, have made fucking tuppence. Tup, um, nothing. But they tell you it's easy. Oh, any old guy can do it. Next question. Did I answer you? Yes, ma'am. Blondie. And you can't call people Blondie, can you? You just did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I'm not an engineer. I'm a mother of three. I'm a mum. I'm a mum of three amazing kids. From where? From Oxford. Oh, okay. So I was convenient. Uh, quite convenient. Okay. Um, one of the questions is, you mentioned earlier about the finger farting and doing lots of things. You also mentioned about uh, bringing in passive income or streams of income. I'm at the minute doing a lot of the finger farting, as you say, with the internet, ideally property, gold, coffee. Um, I was dealt with a really bad hand a couple of years ago. I lost my husband and with nothing. So for me, I'm very determined. So you, uh, you mean physically lost because you Physically died. Okay. I physically died uh, 20 months ago, left me financially broke with three children. And rather than thinking, shit, what do I do? I'm sure you thought that, but you got bad set. I okay. did. I, I then got up and I thought, I've got to make this happen. I've got the determination. I'm being referred to as the judge. Well, you, well, the, well, well you, you, you have more than most in any room if you have that determination. Go ahead. So for me, at the minute, I am doing a lot of different things. Um, one of the things that would generate me the most money and the leverage is property. Um, I'm being the deal maker with regards to I have people with a lot of money. Uh, I've got people sending me deals that are anything okay. from millions to hundred million. So you're a middle person. Yes. Okay. But then I have people saying, oh, you don't want to be a middle person, you want to create a business. But then, do I want to build a massive business because in a way, I'm, I've got three children I need to be there for. They've just lost their dad. I've got five, 12 and 14 year old children. I want to be there for them, but I also want to create the financial stability back that was taken away. Okay. Your answer is not any more difficult than any other answer I give. Uh, it's not what you're going to want to hear. The, um, nobody gives a shit that your husband passed away. Okay. Uh, and um, your, your kids, no matter what, no matter if you're there every day, uh, loving them to death, in 15 years from now, they're going to tell you to go fuck off. That's just the way it is. And, um, but... You have an opportunity um, uh, in what you do as a middle person. You can form a middle person consultancy firm. Because right now you can't sell your business because you don't have one. But if you form what you do into a business, then you can have something to sell. But what you want is to be in a position that you're not relying on passive income forever. Because passive income, guys and gals, makes you lazy. Passive, contrary to what you've been told by all the guys, passive income makes you lazy. Uh, you want to create a business around what you do successfully, uh, at least in theory from what you've told me. Uh, and so spend the next months or years building it into a brand. Uh, so when they think of property in wherever, or they think of between 600,000 and 3 million whatever, they think of you and they have a name. And I don't know, uh, branding's not my expertise, Notwithstanding, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I didn't come up with a $50 billion man idea. Um, but brand yourself and create a business. Uh, so then you have something to sell down the road. You did mention earlier about if it's not made you any money in a certain amount of time, stop. Right. Because of what's happened, I basically just did anything I could to try and get... Sure, you need to generate some kind of revenue. I understand. So we're trying to sort of create a cash flow. As they say, cash flow is king. But I've got some deals on the table that are like 70 million uh, pounds, but then I've not got any cash flow. So it's just no. Okay, but I mean, how, how long are they going to be on the table? Well, I mean, uh, the, the, there's a time for the, you got to go home, you got to come down off the hill to milk the cow. You got to milk the cow. There's got to be a time when the deal, uh, either shit or get off the pot. And uh, the, um, so I don't know if it's, you've been at this three months or three years. But I mean, uh, unless you work for a Prudential where they have a three-year risk, it's in the three-year risk portfolio section, an individual can't wait three years. Uh, and unless, when you build a company around that, you may have an intern. Uh, and uh, I would recommend uh, uh, interns are, are a great source of uh,
workforce and occasionally you, uh, you get a real superstar out of it. Uh, but I would build a brand around uh, that you do a certain kind of property. And I don't know the numbers, but uh, 70 million property, I don't, know, uh, I don't know if that's a lot or a little in your um, Oxfordshire. I don't know wh whether it is or not. Uh, it sounds like a lot, because if, if, uh, I would assume they've got houses between 5 and 15 million pounds around here. Okay, it's five, okay, okay, okay. But I mean, uh, how long has it been for sale? Have they adjusted the price? Who's the seller? I mean, there's, you know, uh, is the financing already set up? I mean, are you a pure finder? There's all kinds of other questions to ask yourself. Uh, if you took the same amount of time that you've spent on the 70 million quid deal on six or seven or eight smaller deals, could you have gotten the six or seven or eight smaller deals? What most of you and most of the people that I talk to are piss poor time managers because nobody's made you accountable to see how much you're getting paid for your time. I can just look by the frowns on your faces that I'm hitting a raw nerve there. I mean, uh, time you can never get back, money you can get back. So when you look at the, the, the time you've invested in these transactions, and these dreams. Uh, now she has to make something happen, had to make something happen because, because she got left, left flat, as they say. Uh, but I know other people, not just you know, widows, uh, that wound up having to support a family. And it's, it's not easy. But I say, if, if QLA was easy, there'd be one on every street corner like Starbucks. It's not easy. And, uh, the, uh, and the reason why I have many fewer Twitter followers and those kind of things is because I tell you it's hard. I have a seven-step program that has been successful from 80 IQs to 180 IQs all over the world. But unless you make the sacrifice to do the seven steps, and the seven steps are on my website. All this is free on my website. And if you don't look at deal flow and how do you get the goddamn money, you can't make it work. You can't, you know, and unless you pull the trigger, and uh, I'm not volunteering any of my mentees that are in the audience, it's not easy. Uh, the, uh, this, okay, okay. Another blondie, okay. Hello, my name is Theodora. I'm originally from the Netherlands, but I now live down south in Portsmouth. Um, my question is, of all of um, pulling the trigger and I feel I have the balls to do it. The problem I have is credibility. Like, yeah, I'm not a doctor, I would love to roll up anything, but you know, I, I have certain expertise, but where did you, you know, do you fake it? Do you make it? Or, you know? Well, the credibility that you, um, that you get is based on you, get, you, you acquire instantly an instant track record because of your dream team. All the six or seven people that um, are part of that dream team, uh, and again, look at uh, how dream team is defined on my website, give you instant credibility. The guy with the 1-0 level, joinery, D. Now, what kind of damn credibility does he have? Now, in the US, that doesn't sound as bad as in the UK. 1-0 level, D, okay, none. But he surrounded himself with uh, some very talented people, uh, and he was um, able to do it. But again, for you, build a dream team. Look how you build a dream team. I have a podcast on how you build a dream team. Um, and just go out and swing at the, you know. You can't hit it for six unless you're on the pitch. And you can't hit it for six. I'm going to give you a, a Dutch analogy in a second. You can't hit it for six if you don't swing away, right? Whether it's a fast bowler, a slow bowler, whatever the goddamn bowler. Same thing in American baseball. But I mean, you can't. Hit it in the, the net for football, in Dutch football, anybody that's the uh, Netherlands, unless you kick it, unless you're running down the field. Most of you guys and gals stay off the pitch. You're reading about how to get on the pitch. You're reading about, oh, if I can get messy and da 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 da. But you're reading about it or listening about it. And you're not actually doing it, you're not actually taking action. And that's why when I say, just fucking do it, I mean, 
It's the easiest way to get started. And it's the only way to be successful. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.